All right, good morning, everybody. It is Wednesday, and we are here in a joint hearing this morning with General Housing and Military Affairs and the Agriculture and Forestry uh, Committee, Forest Products Committee. Um, Forestry. Oh, I got it right. Okay. Um, and we are here with uh, with Representative Carolyn Partridge, who is the chair of that committee, and and her and her committee. And we're here to take a hearing on agricultural housing. And the reason um, we wanted to put this together was was relatively simple. In that we, the housing committee, do not know that much about agricultural housing, and it kind of operates outside of the outside of the purview of of the affordable housing work that we do. However, it's clear that the needs on with agricultural housing are great. Um, and that's what we're going to hear. We're going to hear, get a description of what that means. Just as setting a foundation for what may happen in the next few years as more money becomes available for, for affordable housing and how better we can serve uh, both the farmers and the workers who do live on the farms to make sure that they are being treated with the dignity that, that they need in housing. And so um, I'm just going to get right underway. I'm going to introduce Representative Partridge, if you have a few words to, to start the day, and then we'll go right to our witnesses. And we have them listed off. Um, and I'll start with, and we'll be starting with um, Buster Caswell in a moment. But Representative Partridge, welcome. Well, thank you, uh, Representative Stevens. And anybody can feel free to call me Carolyn. I, um, I really appreciate this opportunity. This is one of those issues that crosses a number of, of uh, territories in terms of committees. And we're delighted to be here today to talk about this because it's a very important issue. So thank you for inviting us. You're very welcome. It's, 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 I think over the last few years, we've seen the need to interact rather than if, if something has the word agriculture and it goes directly to your committee and we don't ever see it, how would we know? And I kind of feel that this was a situation here until we've been asked to take a look at it. And I want to start the day by um, uh, int introducing, you're listed as Ernest, but can we call you Buster? Yes, absolutely. All Everyone's right. been uh, calling me Buster for uh, since the childhood, so thank you. So welcome to the committees, Buster. This is something that you've been asking for for a couple of years to, to really start this conversation in this public forum, but there have been other forums that, where this has been discussed and moved on. And so um, again, welcome, please introduce us to yourself. Thank and, you. um, and then we'll move from you to Marita um, and then Tom, and then we have, a, we have people after that as well. Welcome. Yes, uh, thank you leaders for all your valuable time and interest in this subject. And I am um, extremely delighted to be invited on this subject. Um, I've had several conversations over the last three or four years on the subject of farm housing. Myself, I've been a uh, farm worker um, pretty much since um, high school back in the 80s and a four year FFA member, just a little bit of a history yet and background. I worked full time most of those years, the last 12 years being full time in agriculture and been a huge supporter of agriculture and have an understanding of some of the needs of the farmers, some of the needs of the workers and a little bit of background. And over the last four or five years, I've learned much um, on the subject of farm housing. And those things that I had learned came from outside of Vermont. Um, I've um, a member of an organization and being part of that large organization Part of its work and its history is farm housing, which I uh, took interest in learning more from other states and then um, try to learn more about those things here in Vermont. Um, 
and learning those things here in Vermont, um, you will learn more, I'm sure. But if you, many folks here have not learned about it. That's why our, we are here. Um, basically, so you could hear and learn more about what I've learned based on what's happened in other states on the subject of farm housing. And um, why is that so much of a need in Vermont is um, a couple of reasons. Um, for renters in Vermont, um, According to the uh, website of the Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition, Vermont is number two in the income wage gap for renters across the country. Number two in, in the wage gap. That's huge out of, out of uh, 50 states. And Vermont is rural. Vermont's very rural. We don't even have a million people in its population. But housing, affordable housing in rural communities is a large subject with that being noted. You could find more on their website. Um, furthermore, um, so there's a need there to address the wage gap. And the wage gap affects the agricultural community when it comes to access to affordable housing. And the Vermont housing community understands that we need to address the needs of affordable housing. And that's been ongoing for several years with the exception of farm housing. We talked about senior housing, much needed, talked about, addressed homelessness, much needed, addressed, and talked about farm housing, not in Vermont, as they had in other states. Other states have came together generally in ways that have been taking place over the last year and a half. Dan Baker will have some information on the number of organizations, the number of times, and the number of people, which is enormous in Vermont, about, I'm going to say, three or four meetings on this subject, trying to learn more of the opportunities and the resources out there. For example, loans and grants through the USDA, through federal guidelines, very much daunting and difficult and challenging. Farmers use those resources. Nonprofit in organizations, in housing organizations use those resources. They also use resources from other federal resources such as HUD, which is fund through each of the states. In many of those states, use and utilize each and more of those resources to build homes and address issues in three different categories. And I talk about three different categories because they are related to farm housing. Those three topics are improving, building, um, um, improving, building, upgrading existing farm housing. For example, our in Vermont, our stock is capacity is full. There's a lot of older and existing farm homes where farmers could use assistance and funding to upgrade those. The other example is building homes on farms for farm workers. Many farms across the country, including Vermont, 
over the last several decades have done that. They've also built homes in agricultural communities off the farms, which um, nonprofits have utilized building homes, for example. This is an example. They've built homes in agricultural communities, like, for example, 20 homes that are specifically affordable for farm workers. And um, so there's three different categories there that all have utilized in a number of states where the farmers utilize those resources or whether the nonprofits utilize those resources or whether our processors and plants and agriculture community use those like cheese plants, there's opportunities for cheese plants, um, butter plants, whatever is out there in Vermont, they could utilize those opportunities as well. Agriculture workers, very much so, you can't define it as a farm worker. If you look at the definition of farm workers, it's very challenging, very challenging. And in Vermont, the data for nonprofits and farmers in the resources to utilize that and the data to use those resources are not really found or known in Vermont. And I know of no housing organizations within Vermont that have really have any success stories of building homes off the farm or assisting workers, I mean, workers and farmers with the right connections on utilizing those resources. Some of those resources in several states are through nonprofit organizations. Some of those resources for farmers are used through the USEA. Some of them are used through the agencies of agriculture. And those resources, as you may hear, and I've heard in our meeting, are very challenging, even for our farmers. But those resources are there. They have a purpose. They need to be used, and they should be utilized, they need to be used. We need to have more success stories, discussions right here in Vermont on this topic. Our farmers need resources. There are many resources that organizations that you will hear more from other than myself that would like to use those resources and connecting the dots. And it's very challenging. And one of my suggestions and recommendations, and I believe other people will recommend this as well, it, and you will hear more data from um, the Ryan report, which the housing community is looking forward to. Uh, discussions I've had in the housing community is there's no data and such. But um, my recommendation is to form a concrete uh, committee, a working group, a task force, or a coalition that permanently work together with housing organizations, farmers, energy corporations, farm worker advocates, very much so farmers, agriculture. And those suggestions you can find, your colleagues in the agriculture department will have very much detailed 200 poor agriculture report. And the housing organizations may not utilize this report very much, but in this report, if the ag community will share that report, what's in there, and I will shorten it for you, can be found in pages right around page 29. And in the area is 
priority strategies. And that's in the area of the agriculture report. And the priority strategies talks about a stronger collaboration between housing organizations and the agriculture community. So my suggestion is, is to find a way to form a community working group and a coalition, and then also listen to the Ryan report and learn more from the Ryan report. And that's all I have. And I'll look forward to any questions anyone uh, may have because discussions need to be needed. And thank you very much for your time leaders. Thank you very much. Thank you, Buster. And we'll try to hold questions till the end and have a round table if we have time left. But thank you so much for coming in and setting the table for us. Um, let's go right to Marita. Good morning, everyone. First of all, thank you for the space and the time. And you know, it's interesting, we're still meeting through Zoom and screen. So I, I will invite you all to look at your screens and to see each of you um, who are here, you know, and who is missing. I think we're missing a lot of people that need to be in the table, bring their voices and why they are not here and why this is not accessible to all the people of color. Um, also, before I, I give my testimony, I just wanna acknowledge that there is the H273 bill that is uh, led by BIPOC and the Land Access Opportunity Act. And I I'm ask you to take it into account because that's something that people of color in Vermont are pushing for and it's really needed. So my name is Marita Canedo, I'm part of Migrant Justice. And we are a grassroots organization of dairy farm workers. We've been around for 10 years talking to everybody about the need of dignified housing. And I can tell you many stories and I can share many pictures, but if you haven't heard, we are right now in the Milk with Dignity campaign, asking Hannah Ford to join the Milk with Dignity program. And Tom Fritsch is gonna talk more about the program, but I wanna tell you that this campaign started because workers were living in a trailer uh, where the gray waters were coming out of the sink and they were tired to live in that crowded trailer. There were seven people in the trailer for four. And uh, they had to walk out of the, of the farm without their pay. Uh, they had to have an action with the support of Vermonters and the press. And finally, they were able to get their stolen wages, but the housing situation never changed. This is one story in so many farms in Vermont. That's the reality. We have to stop thinking that the beautiful landscape of family farms in Vermont is the beautiful things that we see on our products in the supermarkets. It's not true. The people that are bringing the food to your table are living in inhumane conditions. And also they are not only staying still, they are analyzing the industry. They are bringing solutions as milk with dignity. I can tell you the story of Adrian who right now it's under uh, milk with dignity uh, farm. Uh, who is uh, in a very good housing condition after being in another farm where uh, basically they were living with rats and pests. And we know that farmers cannot afford, it's really um, expensive to afford changing housing or bringing a new housing, especially thinking that Vermont has so many uh, alternatives and initiatives for energy efficiency housing. Um, but the people itself that are bringing the food to your table are not, you know, they don't have access to these things. So we really need to open our eyes to see this urgency, as Buster is saying, you know, first understand who is harvesting your food, not making a blind eye to giving more money for, um, you know, taking care of the land without acknowledging that there are already people living in those uh, lands uh, in inhumane conditions. I can tell you the story of other workers in Addison County that were living in the garage of the farm. And the one bed was um, on top of an older like um, water fountain for the cows. They had to make their own beds. And that was last year. So I'm not talking about things that are happening like many, many years ago. 
Uh, we, as an organization led by the workers that are the experts because they are living this day by day, are bringing the solution with milk with dignity is a corporate campaign, but we ask the state to really understand that when you have to allocate money, when you have to think about passing bills, you have to really listen to this community because you don't wanna eat your cheese with um, the hands of someone that is suffering every day. You don't wanna get your milk uh, with violence. You are what you eat and you really need to understand this. Migrant Justice has a lot of research. We did data about housing, health and safety. There are a lot of regulations uh, that are not investigated that needs to happen. And we know that while creating milk with dignity was the only way to bring enforcement mechanism, the standards that are maybe even under the regular law, like there are uh, code violations in housing that no one is investigating. And we are telling you, you can go to our webpage, you can go to our Facebook, you're gonna see many videos and testimonies of people talking about the housing. So I think it's time, this is the time to really listen to these communities and not only their complaints, but the solutions that, that they are bringing. We can spend a lot of money on task force and research and more research and more conversations and more paying people to do more questionnaires and, and surveys. But we're saying it's enough. We have the result, we have the people, we have direct access to dairy farm workers. And we know that the farmers, even if they wanna change the things, the price of milk are so low, still as the seventies. We know that um, immigrants are not eligible for so many uh, housing benefits from the state. So we have to be practical, we have to be creative. Vermont is very known as an, uh, a state that it's ahead in the country. So let's be ahead on this, listening to these communities. Um, I just wanna pass it to Tom Fritchie because he's gonna talk to you about the solution that these workers themselves have brought to you. That's the only program in there right now that is enforcing standards, the standards that have been created by the workers themselves and is financed by corporations. So if the state has the money and has the opportunity to support the expansion of milk with dignity and this model, because it's a model that can be replicated in many industries, I think you have the responsibility to do it. Uh, because again, I'm gonna say this phrase that we use a lot. Um, you might think, you know, uh, where your milk comes from. And the answer is always the cows, but the cows don't milk themselves. So think about it. And thank you so much again. And uh, yeah, I invite you to, to read uh, John Ryan's report as well. So thank you. Thank you, Marita. And I do want to acknowledge that one of the one of the difficulties in this work is that um, the voices that we do need to hear are at work, and and we do acknowledge that 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 permeates a lot of the um, issues that our committees deal with. Are you know when we deal with working people, um, it's not easy to take time off to do this even remotely. So I thank you for lending your voice and for, for acknowledging that, that, that's, that we're not hearing all the voices that we need to hear. So thank you. Um, Tom Fritchie. Thank you very much to Representative Stevens and Representative Partridge and all the members of both committees for inviting us to testify. It's an honor to talk to you about this important issue. And I think also a big responsibility to convey to you as best I can what we know about farm worker housing in Vermont. I'm Tom Fritchie, I'm the Executive Director of the Milk with Dignity Standards Council. I've dedicated my career in significant part to safety and health on farms and in other workplaces, starting in 2001 with the Maine Migrant Health Program, continuing with the Southern Poverty Law Center and elsewhere before joining this effort here. The Milk with Dignity Standards Council is a Vermont nonprofit organization that was created in order to, get to work together with dairy farmers and dairy farm workers participating in the Milk with Dignity Program. The program launched in Vermont after Migrant Justice, who you just heard from another Vermont-based nonprofit, reached agreement with Ben and Jerry's in October 2017 to implement standards for working and housing conditions on the dairy farms in Ben and Jerry's supply chain. We estimate that 
about 20% of Vermont milk production is covered by the Milk with Dignity program now. And so since October 2017, MDSC has been working together with between 50 and 70 dairy farms to ensure that farms are meeting the standards in the Milk with Dignity Code of Conduct, and that in areas where farms are not yet meeting the standards, that they make concrete and verifiable progress towards the standards. So the Code of Conduct, which Marita introduced, includes standards covering health and safety, wages, schedules, non-discrimination, freedom from retaliation and sexual harassment, and housing for farms where housing is provided to employees. And the code also incorporates standards from existing federal and state laws, such as the Occupational Safety and Health Act. Most of the housing standards we uphold actually come from the Vermont Rental Housing Health Code and other state laws that apply to farm worker housing. So to assess compliance with all the standards in housing and in other areas, MDSC operates a 24 hour worker support line via which farmers and farm workers can call with questions or concerns at any time. We answer in English and Spanish and we conduct objective factual investigations and engage the farm in a problem solving discussion specific to their context to look for solutions to any problems that are confirmed through an investigation. So the other major way that we assess compliance with standards in the code of conduct is through annual farm audits. In our audit process, we interview farm workers and farm owners or managers, inspect employee housing in some areas of work sites, and review farm policies and other written records. Our housing inspections include measurements of square footage of habitable space available, air quality measurements, and visual inspections of requirements such as smoke detectors and other fire safety devices. To my knowledge, we're the only agency or organization that has inspected dairy farm worker housing for compliance with Vermont laws. And so after our audit, we compile this information into a written report that's only for the farm. For farms that are not yet meeting all standards in the code of conduct, we then work with them using the audit report as a tool to develop corrective action plans that ask farms to make commitments to concrete progress within workable timelines. And I say context specific problem solving because we know that whether it's housing or occupational safety and health, a plan that solves a problem on one farm might not necessarily work to solve a similar issue on another farm. So essential to the success of the program has been the annual Know Your Rights and Responsibilities education component that ensures that people on farms are informed about how the program works and how to use it. So our auditors are not parachuting in to talk to people who have no idea what the purpose of the visit is, but rather we're speaking to people, both farmers and farm workers, who are informed about relevant topics and the goals of the process, which is to ensure that farms are meeting standards and that consistent improvements are made where needed. So specifically about farm worker housing, it's obviously it's important for many reasons. Farm workers who do not have adequate rest and sleep when they're not working, if it's because of housing conditions, may face short and long-term healthcare conse health consequences from poor indoor air quality or interruptions of sleep. Farms businesses also suffer if their workforce is not in good health or well rested. Everyone involved in dairy farm work, including milkers, herds people, feeders, farm owners and managers, works very hard doing important jobs that require a great deal of concentration and skill and often physical exertion and often for long hours. So obviously for farms in operation 24 hours a day or close to it, having employees always close by is also a major benefit. As I'm sure you know, every farm is different. During our first round of farm assessments, we found farms providing excellent farm worker housing that included adequate space and safe conditions. We also found farms providing housing to employees that does not meet legal standards in a variety of ways. So the first year we did audits was 2018. I have, I'm gonna give some numbers from our 2019 audits, which is our second, our second round. So in 2019, we found on participating farms, 178 qualifying workers lived in housing provided by their employers. And the farms were providing, the farms in the program were together providing a total of 72 housing units to employees. Out of those units, 46% were fully compliant with the Vermont Rental Housing Health Code. Reasons for non-compliance on other ones in, in other housing units include holes in structural problems, pest infestations, inconsistent heat or water, inadequate habitable space, 
lack of fire safety devices, and some other things. Out of those units, 22% had less than 200 square feet of habitable space per occupant. 17% had only one exit. 10% had one or more workers permanently sleeping in a living room or other common area. And 8% were closets or other spaces inside barns. One example of that last situation was a 10 foot by 14 foot concrete room that's next to a milking parlor in which three adults working full-time at the farm lived on a full-time year-round basis. They had two bunk beds, and so the three of them used the one empty bunk to store their clothing and other belongings. They had a stove and refrigerator inside this room and used the worksite bathroom for their necessities. A visitor to the farm would not have known that there were people living behind the closed door in the hallway right outside the parlor. So the data that I, the numbers I just gave uh, cover housing provided to farm workers who speak any language or of, a, of any national origin. So that includes housing provided to people whose primary language is English, some whose primary language is Spanish, and some whose primary language is an indigenous language such as Tojo Laval. The program uses the term qualifying workers, which includes any non-managerial employees of dairy farms who milk, scrape manure, care for animals, or do, do certain other jobs, regardless of where they're from or what their language is. So also I wanna note that the 2019 data I gave reflect improvements from the conditions found in our 2018 assessments of participating farms. And a lot of that progress is detailed in our first program report, which I've shared with the committees. We don't yet have complete data for the 2020 audit year, but I'm confident that that data will show additional improvements beyond the numbers that I just shared from 2019. The improvements that farms have made so far include increased access to smoke and carbon monoxide detectors and fire extinguishers, numerous repairs to appliances and structures, at least a dozen new windows, one new roof, two new employee housing units, two better units that were opened up to employees to live in, and the expansion of three other housing units in order to alleviate overcrowding. And these are just the beginning. These improvements are the result of hard work and good faith participation by farm workers and farm owners cooperating in a process made possible by the Milk with Dignity Code, the education sessions, and the MDSC's detailed monitoring and facilitation. Participating farmers in the Milk with Dignity program deserve credit for their work with us to allow transparent verification of conditions and to make improvements where needed. Farm workers also deserve credit for their leap of faith to participate in the process. For many of them at various points, it's been scary. They've been afraid to speak up about concerns for fear that their employer will be unhappy that they've said something and retaliate. And Ben and Jerry's also deserves credit as the historic first participating buyer in the program. Among other contributions, the requirement that farms meet code standards have set expectations that did not exist before, and their premiums paid to participating farms have helped make housing improvements possible that appeared to be impossible before. A piece of this work that we're doing is an exciting pilot project with Efficiency Vermont to begin connecting farms with zero energy modular housing that would provide safe indoor air quality, excellent ventilation, and efficiency, uh, efficient energy use that would benefit primarily farm owners, but also have secondary benefits for, farm, for all Vermonters. We're also excited about potential future collaboration to expand the range of solutions with groups like New Frameworks, and excited to hear from, uh, from John Ryan about his report and any additional solutions that come into the field to help, uh, help accelerate the process of improvements where they are needed. So thank you to everyone for your attention to this important issue. Thank you, Tom. Um, and Tom and Marita, before we go on to um, our next witness, Gus Selig <clears throat> from VHCB, where we'll start to hear about some of these studies and the other in the programs. Can you just, this is a simple question. I think, but it never is with housing. Do farm workers, when farm workers are hired, are hired on and, and offered housing, are they offered leases? Do they sign a lease to live in the properties on the farm? Is that required through, um, I mean, it, again, this is a difference between what we deal with every day in our committee and, and, and what might be available on the farms. I can respond to that. It's just a verbal agreement. And we work very close with the Vermont Law School 
to have like a fact sheet about how to deal as a landlord or, or a tenant when you have just a verbal agreement. So also people don't know which kind of situation are they gonna have with housing when they get to a farm. Okay, I just, there's a lot to that simple statement, but I appreciate it because it's, um, there's, 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 there's just a lot to it. And I think we'll get to that as we keep investigating the situation here. Um, thank you. And thank you, Tom, for that, um, for that information. Thank you. Um, Gus Seeley, welcome back. Uh, good morning. For the record, Gus Seelig, Director for the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. Liz Gleason, the Director of our Farm and Forest Viability Program, is also with me this morning. I'm going to be uh, very brief, uh, Mr. Chairman, because I think it's important for you to hear from John and hear from Mr. Baker. Um, let me start by just saying a, a big thanks to Buster and to Marita and Tom for the work that they've done to raise the profile of this issue, which is so important. Um, and a as you were just indicating with your question, a complex one when your housing is tied um, to your employment in the way that it is, and it makes it much more difficult uh, to raise concerns um, about it. Um, and we're at a very difficult time uh, in the agriculture industry and COVID's made it worse and makes it harder to come by investment. I was talking with uh, a member of the other body um, a few weeks ago and one of his thoughts was, gee, we could pull in a lot of federal money on this issue. And I think um, that's gonna be really difficult and it points to something you've always been an advocate of uh, Chair Stevens, of, of the transfer tax being fully utilized um, because the legal status of some employees may make it hard to match this with the programs USDA offers. Um, I, I, I told, I had a chance for the first time to talk to Buster probably about a month ago. Um, and at that point, uh, your appropriations committee was talking about supporting the governor's recommend of $20 million in one-time funding. And what I told him that day was that we would at least, at the very least, based on the report that you're about to hear about from John, begin a repair program with a half a million dollars. Um, your committee then doubled the governor's recommendation to $40 million. The, the Senate is considering that now, um, and we would certainly be committed to doing more had the opportunity to meet with Marita and Tom uh, probably a week or 10 days ago to talk about the zero energy modular project. Um, we've done about 50 zero energy modular homes across Vermont. It's a great product. We just brought eight of them into Vermont with the CRF funding uh, you provided last year. Th those dollars were directed only for homeless folks um, in order to pass muster with the federal government. Uh, but it's a good product, uh, not an expensive one, but a good product. And we're prepared to do more with that, assuming the state funds are there to do it. Um, so there is a lot to be done um, and standing up a program will not be easy. And, and I just wanna to point to two difficulties um, in terms of, it, so that we may ask you to make sure there's some language in the bill that authorizes a demonstration program of some sort. The first is that we are told to conduct our mission without ever displacing anybody. And again, there we may make investments in housing and somebody may lose their employment and then lose their housing. So um, for whatever reasons, good or bad. Um, the second is that we always strive for permanent affordability as agriculture changes it may not always po be possible to achieve that goal, but I think fundamentally the time is ripe uh, to do right here and uh, we should begin the process of utilizing the state trust fund uh, to address this very fundamental issue of human decency and human dignity. Um, so I'm gonna stop there for the moment because I think it's more important for you to get into the the uh, particulars that John and Dan can offer, unless Liz, you want to add a few things from the from your perspective. Although I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Gus. Liz. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for having me. I'm the program director for our 
Farm and Forest Viability Program. I guess I'll just share a few quick notes. Um, our program works with over 150 farmers a year. We're a long-term in-depth business assistance program, mostly focused on working with farm owners and how to improve their businesses on, you know, whatever, working towards whatever their goals might be. And I guess I'll just note that um, we really see farm owners um, acknowledging the incredible importance of their employees. And as John's report states, there's about 20,000 people who work on farms in Vermont, about 8,500 of those are people who are not owners and not family members. Um, and we know that the agricultural industry and all of the products that Vermont is known for couldn't be produced without the incredibly important work of those employees. I think we'll get into these details later, but the some of the challenges that farm owners face in making investments in their farm are important to understand so that however we structure some of the um, ways to make improvements are structured correctly so that people will use them and they'll have a positive impact. And I really think the, the points that came out in the report and that we all have heard about around the low margins in agriculture, the incredible instability right now in the dairy industry, um, the constant sort of downward pressure on prices are real factors and really understanding how that impacts farmer decision-making will help us structure programs that can help make improvements. I'll also note that one interesting component came up um, and that was sort of the complexity and um, lack of awareness around the design and permitting and building um, if farmers are to invest in new structures. And I think that's an interesting and really specific component of this. And the viability program can be helpful to this effort in a variety of ways. One major one is that we often play a big role in helping farm owners access financing. Um, we often do play a really big sort of connecting role, making sure people know about the resources that are out there. So if there were a, a more sort of streamlined way to have access to understanding the permitting and regulations, that's also something that we might be able to assist with. Um, so I think that's all I'll add and just really appreciate being here and appreciate hearing from all of these amazing people. Thanks so much. Great, thank you, Liz, and welcome. That's your first time in my in our committee as well. And so yeah. it's always good to see um, the other facets of VHCB um, and, and what they provide. So when we talk about the property transfer tax, we're not only talking about, I mean, we're talking about VHCB at large and um, it's great to meet you. Thank you. Nice to meet you too. Thanks so much. All right, off to Dan Baker. Um, Dan, welcome. And if you could just introduce yourself, where you're, where you're from, and, and please share your story. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the committees for the invitation to come this morning. Dan Baker, an associate professor of community and international development at University of Vermont. And as an academic, you know, we like to um, show a little data. So if it's okay with the committee, I'm just gonna uh, go through a few slides with some um, research results related to housing. Did we, did we make you a co-host? I am, I think, I, I think Ron's already yes. done Yes, there you are. Are you, seeing, are you seeing the first slide? Great, I'm just gonna flip through a few things here um, and I'll, I'll uh, share this with Ron so he can share this with the committee afterwards. Uh, for the last year, I've been, as, as Buster mentioned, I've been um, facilitating an, a really informal group uh, that's kind of been interested in farm worker housing. And the reason I wanna mention that is just really for two reasons. One is uh, the number of uh, organizations that have been joining that group increasing over the last year. And the surprising range of participants, you know, from traditional housing to farm work advocates, um, uh, it's been uh, really to energy. To energy, this has been quite a broad array of interest um, that have been um, involved. I also just want to uh, talk or kind of note that when we talk about farm workers, there's really several sort of groupings of farm workers. You know, one might be the considered more like the traditional or local 
uh, group of uh, dairy farm workers. Um, some of them are uh, kind of live in our community and some kind of do move from farm to farm across the region. For them, for that group, they live, uh, some of them have on-farm housing and uh, many of them have off-farm housing. And for this group, you know, they face the affordable housing crises, you know, that is kind of a statewide challenge. The second group are the H-2A visa holders. They are temporary seasonal workers here on legal visas. Um, they are kind of their housing is regulated. Um, and <clears throat> uh, mostly they work on kind of our, our fruit and vegetable farms. For dairy farms, uh, dairy farms, Farms, you know, do not have a visa program at this moment for um, for foreign workers. You know, the range of how many folks kind of in this category or here in Vermont is, is quite broad. We don't have a census of it. Roughly 800 at the low end, 13 and 1500 at the high end. And for these folks, on-farm housing is absolutely essential. Almost all of these of these uh, workers live on farm. Very briefly, kind of the data I'm going to share is from uh, a series of, uh, of research projects I've done. Sort of my approach to uh, understanding the dairy industry has been to go back and forth between uh, interviewing uh, dairy farmers and interviewing uh, dairy farm workers. And I've done a series of those you can see in 2000 and 2018 with dairy farmers in 2016 and 2018 and 2019 with um, primarily uh, Latinx farm workers. And right now I'm working on a project with the uh, Vermont Department of Health on, uh, on dairy farm response to COVID. Last little note, and it'll be my last slide, is I also do an annual uh, uh, I, I poll, it's part of the Vermonter poll, looking at, farm, at Vermonters' opinions on uh, dairy farm or migrant labor, and I'll show you that last. Um, most of the farms that I've interviewed are all the farms that I dairy farm, farms I interviewed are dairy farms that hire non-family labor. So kind of this data set is only for farms that hire kind of off-farm labor. Uh, in uh, 2018, amongst the uh, 71 farms that we interviewed, 57% uh, of the workers were uh, Latinx workers. So it's a very substantial portion of our uh, dairy farm labor force. There's uh, some differences between kind of the US workers and the Latin work Latinx workers in addition to um, kind of that relate to housing outside of, of uh, uh, documentation or jobs. US workers have tended to have uh, kind of more experience and longer time on each farm. And the Latinx workers are, uh, have much shorter tenure. And so there's more turnover. And uh, that is important for housing uh, kind of in terms of both, you know, kind of maintenance and, and the social environment. When we, in 2018, we were looking at both wages and non-farm uh, benefits. And what we found is that uh, housing is one of the major non-farm, excuse me, non-wage benefits that far dairy farmers provide to uh, their workers. For Latinx workers, housing and utilities were provided by 100% of the farms we surveyed. And uh, housing was provided about for about 62% of farms for US workers. So for Latinx workers, um, uh, housing is, is central. When we asked, the farm workers about their housing. As you can see, um, about a third uh, said that uh, their housing uh, caused them either moderate or extreme stress. And uh, about for about 11%, uh, their housing was actually extremely stressful. And we found about 13% uh, of farms had at least one farm, farm worker reporting extreme stress related to housing. So the majority of workers uh, have low to no stress, but for about 10%, uh, it's extreme stress and about a third have some, have some stress. And um, 
We're particularly interested in COVID about housing density. And we do find that for some farms, uh, density can be quite high, you know, nine people per living, living in each house uh, with an average of about four people per house. Uh, importantly for COVID, almost 11%, about over 10% uh, share a bedroom with uh, an unrelated person. And so for these, for these workers in, these housing, in this housing, clearly that um, space and crowding is an issue. The thing I wanted to point out though is that density is complicated. Uh, when we actually, when we ask people, uh, workers, uh, about the stress related to density, the vast majority said that density was not a cause of significant stress. And that may be because uh, they live with family members. It may be because the housing itself is a um, sort of an opportunity to live in a space that where people uh, share a similar culture, speak a similar language. Um, and uh, um, uh, kind of complicates things. Um, just the last two slides, uh, I just have a few recommendations kind of based on our research. Um, you know, one is that uh, it's important, I think, to note that for the majority of uh, farm workers, um, housing appears to be uh, a relatively low cause of stress, but for about a third, it is a, it is a significant cause of stress. So that's a third of the workers that we've surveyed. For them, uh, housing is quite uh, an important issue. There needs to be an, a, there needs to be more research on the specific housing issues and whether or not we need, and for some housing, this is absolutely the case, you need a whole new house. Like that particular house is not gonna be um, uh, salvageable. But then for a significant other share, um, you know, we can, you know, repairs are possible, working on a bathroom, working on the heating or ventilation, uh, repairing um, issues in the kitchen. And I just want to make a note that uh, much of this housing are manufactured homes or some, you know, often called mobile homes or trailers. And if any of you have ever worked on or visited one of these homes, particularly the older homes, repair is challenging. You know, they weren't particularly well built to begin with and they don't age well. Uh, and that's a very significant share of farm worker housing. I've been uh, currently talking to some farmers as well as I just was talking yesterday to uh, cover home repair in Southern Vermont, trying to get an idea of what people feel right now would be uh, a useful amount of money to do kind of just the repairs, not the whole house replacement. And the range is probably somewhere between 10 and $20,000. We all know uh, materials prices have increased dramatically at this, this year. Um, I just wanted to give kind of a round figure uh, there. Uh, and, uh, and of course, I recommend that the community consider uh, assistance for farmers and that need to simply replace whole homes. And uh, the last thing I want to circle back to what Buster said, there is this broad uh, group, stakeholder group. It's informal and uh, some process for sort of formalizing that group that includes uh, absolutely the housing folks, but also farmers and farm worker representatives. Uh, I work right now with uh, the UVM Medical Center on uh, kind of some health related issues. So I guess I, I would recommend that we think broadly when we think about housing and uh, how to move forward. And then the last slide, I just want to show this to you. This is my public opinion research. I just want to finish with this. When we've asked since, excuse me, since 2000, uh, since 2010 about Vermonters' opinions of the impacts that uh, undocumented farm workers have on Vermont communities, we've seen consistently high support for these workers and that's actually risen over those years. And so the environment that whatever policy you choose to make to help these workers, um, that environment is actually very positive. And the people feel strong that these are, this is a community of foreign born workers that contribute positively to Vermont and to the um, support of our dairy farms. And I'll stop there. 
Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Dan. Um, Dan, can you share this with us? Can you send a copy of the slide deck to our assistant and he can I, post it for us? I absolutely will sell it, send it to Ron, yes. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and now let's move right to John. Um, John Ryan, welcome. And um, you have a report that uh, is it, I don't even know if it's officially re released yet, but you have a, a report on the housing needs assessment. And if you could just give us a rundown of, of um, how you came to this study and, and how long, it, you know, just give us a story of this study and it, what you've provided to us is, is quite full of information, some of which we've heard today, but really points to what, um, what we're really getting at here. So welcome, thank you. Well, thank you, um, <clears throat> Chairman Stevens, Chairman Partridge. Others, thanks for inviting me today. Um, by way of introduction, I have been a uh, affordable housing consultant for the last 30 years, working largely in communities in rural Vermont and around rural New England. Um, I did happen to spend six years as the head of the Agricultural De Ag Development Program for the Vermont um, Sustainable Jobs Fund. Um, and have had an opportunity to, to work with and do deep dive coaching with um, 40 or 50 agricultural enterprises in Vermont over the last several years. Um, I am used to, the, the occupational hazard of a consultant is you, uh, you prepare a report and it sits on somebody's uh, desk forever and you know little of it ever gets read. So it was a particularly um, pleasurable to ha have my virtually hot off the press last draft, um, you know, sort of rushed to this committee because the interest was there. And I'm really grateful for that. Uh, I think from a, from a political sense in the best use of that word, this is as complex and challenging a problem as I could imagine constructing. Um, you have the interplay of a challenged uh, uh, sector of our economy um, in that is central to the to sort of this sort of the brand and and value of the state. Um, and you have that intersecting with a, a group of, of individuals who are who for the largest portion of are not even recognized officially as being here. And so you've got a whole series of challenges that range from the you know, the, the, the ones that are beyond the control of, of, of this body to resolve and things which are quite specific to the experiences of individual farms and individual situations. So it's a little challenging to try to understand what would be the best information to convey to this group. So I'll be brief um, and say that nothing that I heard from any of the previous uh, speakers um, uh, would I disagree with. I think there was real value presented in the perspective that you've already heard. Um, so I will say that I was brought in by VHCB, um, probably for reasons not dissimilar from your two committees, which is to say they knew the problem was there. There hadn't been a lot, there's not a lot of information out there to be gotten, and there was value in having somebody come take a look at what data was available um, and to look at what were the issues that needed to be addressed, what were the challenges, um, what was the scale of the problem, and what were the, you know, what were some of the potential solutions or processes that could be followed going forward. So the idea that these two committees are going to you know, keep their attention on this issue now, I think is really valuable. I don't think it's gonna be a quick fix in any sense of the word to try to address it. Um, and I think at the very beginning, there was a, a lot of, um, for me, discomfort after doing most of my study work in the area of affordable housing, where there is relatively reliable data sets over long periods of time to really look at changes and trends in the situation. Um, but that is not the case here. Um, it, was, it was essentially trying to look into a black box and try to figure out, well, what is the nature of the, 
um, the issue that we're really trying to look at. Um, there was a lot of good work done by Dan, um, by Migrant Justice and the Milkwood Dignity Program to provide some insight. There are a lot of individuals that I had the opportunity to interview um, that have been on many farms, have understood it, if only anecdotally, the nature of the uh, experience. So from that, I was, I did my best to give the HCB an op a sense of the scale of the issues that are there and the challenges that are, that are presented um, when trying to address this need. Um, I'll start by saying I didn't speak with anyone in my entire process who was not supportive of both the rights of workers to live with decency in the homes that they had, but also to have agricultural, um, uh, the agricultural industry be sustainable in Vermont. And, and I'm hopeful and I realize there will be challenges that whatever solutions we need to do has to address both of those things. This is not a case of one or the other. They both need to be understood. The key issues that I, I would point to are that most of my focus and most of the focus of these uh, uh, previous uh, um, testimonies has been about housing for workers who are on the, who are working on who live on the farm. Um, that group represents roughly two thousand workers living on about six hundred on about six hundred farms. Um, so that's only a relatively small portion of the roughly seven thousand farms that are uh, that are in Vermont and the twenty thousand you know, farm workers, both the principals, their families, and those that are hired. Um, so I, before I turn my attention to that focus group of folks who are on the, working on the farm, uh, I wanna acknowledge that there are a significant number of farm workers who are, uh, who are commuting to work from their homes in rural Vermont, and that their needs because they are low wage workers, are the, are the needs of all low income households in, in rural Vermont. And that much of the, uh, of the housing development and for good reasons based on infra infrastructure and social services and other issues tends to concentrate in the, um, in sort of the sub, the sub um, regional centers. Um, and that there is little opportunity in the rural communities where the farm, uh, the farm labor exists for affordable housing in the traditional sense. The largest group is actually the farmers themselves, the owners and their family members, those who make the decisions around farming. Um, when you look at the, at the incomes that they earn from the, uh, the profits of their farm, they represent a pretty reasonable share of the low income homeowners living in rural Vermont. Um, it is not a group of people who can afford to go take out home improvement loans and other kinds of things the way many, many folks can in suburban and more urban centers um, because their incomes are also um, limited. So I think this, is no, this should come as no surprise to any of us who've been in Vermont for a while, but it is to recognize that there is a need that goes beyond that which is targeted at the folks who are working and living on the farm as employees. When I turn my attention to that, I, I, would, I would sort of point out this quality and it's been referenced before. Um, the majority of those who live on the, on the farm are in the dairy industry. The majority of those are in the larger dairies um, the majority of that is concentrated in Addison, Franklin, and Orleans County. Um, the vast majority of those who are living on farm, uh, on farms in dairy in those three counties do not have their full authorization to be working in the United States. And so they are not eligible 
to be housed in programs that are funded by the US by the USDA. Um, they have and um, and they live often with the uncertainty and the fear of being deported. And so their need to stay on farm is as much a function of that insecurity as it is of their occupation. Um, and so there's a real need to find ways to improve the conditions in those farms, which are they're concentrated in a relatively small number of farms that is workable both for the farmer um, and, for the, uh, and for the workers and the funding sources um, that, that can be, uh, be, be, be brought to bear. So that's one of the challenging issues that I think um, you will need to be able to address is how to delink the uh, citizenship and as Gus alluded to, perhaps even the permanent affordability component um, from some of this in, in, in a way that will sustain both agriculture and the goals of affordable housing. Um, the, the second thing that I would point out is that the second largest group is a group of folks who are migrant workers here legally under the H-2A program. Uh, that group too works largely in non-dairy, in orchards um, and in and field crops. Um, they're in a very targeted um, group of farms. There's probably about 50 or 60 at most a year who have ongoing contracts um, to have H-2A workers. That program is intended to provide for um, a, a, a oversight uh, to the quality of the housing that those individuals have. Um, I can only say that the overall standards of H-2A housing and the, and, the, uh, and the other farm worker housing are not significantly different. They range dramatically and there are some pretty inadequate housing in the H-2A program. Uh, the USDA does allow for their funds to be used now, it's just a recent improvement um, with H-2A workers. So it is possible for a, pro a project to be built both on farm and off farm that can combine housing for uh, migrant workers who are H-2A workers, as well as for domestic workers. Um, and even in some instances in their pilots are made available to non-farm working folks as well. So there is both opportunity and, and ability to provide um, more scaled housing in certain communities um, that addresses the needs of both um, farm workers as well as non-farm workers. And I guess that draws to me uh, the uh, attention to what I think is probably the most important issue that I can see if we're trying to make progress immediately. The, um, the individuals who've spoken already spoke as, as I wholly agree on the need to have a group of folks committed to addressing this issue from a variety of, of areas. Um, money is an important factor. Um, I sur we surveyed about 65 farms, almost all of whom have farm workers about their needs, their willingness to address those needs and the challenges to doing so. And certainly money is the most important factor. Um, but it is not the only factor. And in some cases, it wasn't even the primary factor. Uh, almost all of these farms are protected in one way or another. They either have land trust restrictions or um, they are under current use. Uh, the challenges of making expansions or additions within those um, can often be quite daunting to individuals who have uh, plenty on their plate already. Um, there are issues around, um, uh, you know, septic capacity um, and simple issues of design and construction management that make a, a willingness and even in some instances a financial ability to make improvements or additions to their housing um, really difficult to, uh, to embrace. 
And so the idea that as part of a willingness to address this issue, um, having there be an uh, individual organization that is there to solve the problem on a case-by-case -case basis, that is able to look at whether this is a situation that is about funding, whether it is about uh, zoning, whether it is about other kind of regulatory purposes, who can work with the land trust around their uh, the values that they allow for, uh, for properties that are in their control, all speak to the need for there to be a staff person or an entity that is saying, this is my focus. My focus is to build trust between the workers and the farmers to give them, to, to expand the opportunities and the funding and to, uh, and to work to address this situation um, on the level that it needs addressing. I think what the Milk with Dignity program has done has been really impressive. I think their ability to build uh, communication links between the farmers and the farm workers is a model that we should be really trying to emulate and, and scale. Um, their ability to bring in uh, private funding, essentially corporate incentives to do this is something which I think could be leveraged with additional potentially public funding to be able to make that happen. But I really see that as one of many possible avenues that could be explored. But it needs someone to say, this is my job. This is what I am doing. And so convening a group of stakeholders is a really important issue. But providing the funding to staff that in my view, will be the difference between seeing real progress in the short term and, and planning, which though I've made my livelihood helping do planning, um, isn't what we're after in the long run. So I'm gonna stop there. Uh, there was so much that I could have talked about about the study itself, but again, trying to understand the perspective of you as, as decision makers in a pretty important role um, I thought it best to really speak to what I think is needed from that perspective going forward. So I'll stop there. Uh, thank you, John. Um, it, the pages that are that you shared with us um, would be testimony if on the next step of just like what exactly you're you're recommending. And I, but you touched on so much that is that is. Um, that was covered in that report. So thank you for that. Um, you know, the difficulty of working with, uh, as you said, the zoning, um, current use issues, uh, septic issues, those are, those are almost the primary uh, barriers, Never mind funding and being able to afford those things, having that infrastructure in place on, in areas where we're, um, where we're trying to make sure that there are clean soils and that things are taken care of, et cetera. You know, it's, 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 it, it, that's exactly what I think we wanted to know about today. Um, Thank you. I get, I have real empathy for both, both the workers and the farmers in this situation. And I think that's really important to keep in mind through all of this. Um, the, you know, for the farmers to ask them to be housing developers is asking a lot. There's really no other industry in Vermont that still has that. And, uh, and at the same time, you know, there's no other industry in Vermont that doesn't need to pay minimum wage or pay overtime to the extent that that's true in the farm community. So it, it's, it, it's hard to put an extra burden on them, but it's equally hard to, to assume that we can therefore put the burden on the people who they have working for them. And I'm glad it's not my job to figure out how to solve that problem. That, that's up to you guys. But anything that I can do to help, I'm happy to try to answer at this point. Um, thank you, John. I'm going to represent Partridge. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Tom. Um, I, I really appreciate the testimony today. And I have to, uh, I have a, just a couple of, I may have some questions, but also just a, um, uh, a couple of uh, things that I want to say, and I have sort of an um, undying frustration with the situation we have 
uh, where dairy workers can't be part of the H-2A program. I was dismayed to hear John say that uh, in some cases, H-2A housing is not up to snuff and that's, that's disappointing. Um, folks that I know who use H-2A workers, uh, you know, it might not be the Taj Mahal, but it's not half bad. Anyway, it's, it's so um, that, I, I just wanna put that out there. I wish that we could at some point, and it's not us, it's the federal government, but I wish that at some point we could get to a point where dairy workers could be part of the H-2A program. Um, I heard you say how many workers, I, I'm curious, um, uh, I, have, I do have a question and then a couple of other things to add, but uh, how, how much are these um, undocumented workers who I really appreciate because we know they keep our farms, our dairy farms in particular, uh, many of them anyway, running, how much are they paid per hour? Are they paid Vermont's minimum wage? I'll, I'll allow others who are closer to that to try to answer it. Tom or Marita? Uh, I, I can jump in as well if you'd like. Um, that was Dan? There's Dan, sure. Yeah. So in 2018, we found a, a medium of about 10.50 an hour uh, in wages. And uh, then we about a little over $2 an hour additional when we valued the, the value of the particularly housing and utilities. Okay, thanks, Dan. Um, that's helpful. Uh, to the two things I wanna add uh, are this. Yesterday we were taking testimony from Commissioner Michael Snyder on just an update on forestry and logging and what have you. And he was talking, uh, we, were ta we kind of uh, verged into uh, the parks, because that's part of his uh, purview. And he talked about how successful the cabins are at our state parks hmm. and how there is, a, and I'm putting this out there just on the table as something to consider, how, how they have, they had, I, I think they maybe launched it, but they, the pandemic put the kibosh on it, but they had an earn and learn program going on where folks at tech centers could um, could build cabins. And I sort of envision some way for us to bring uh, the larger community into this in terms of using Vermont wood. We know our, our, our foresters and, and loggers are struggling uh, using Vermont wood to potentially make uh, what we're calling, I guess, tiny houses for some of these folks. I get that there are, there are complications that septic and what have you could be a problematic, but there might be ways to solve that problem. But I'm just putting that out there. So working with the high school tech centers, potentially building some structures for these um, the very worthy workers. And the other one is current use. Uh, and la you know, there's this whole issue about if you have structures on your, your property, you have to withdraw two acres from your current use land to, um, to take account for that. Well, last year we passed a bill which, which allows you to cluster housing and per, potentially only take two acres out from maybe five units, maybe more, as long as they're on the two acres. So I'm just putting that out there. Uh, as I said, in case I get hit by a truck, you all, you have that knowledge, could be helpful. All right, that's it. Thanks, Tom. Can I, can I answer to Representative Carolina about your idea of cabins? Please yes. go ahead, yep. Yeah, it's something that farm workers already have been thinking about. We've been partnering with new frameworks to have uh, former farm workers building uh, cabins that are um, efficiency, like sustainable. Uh, partnership with Efficiency Vermont for other housing in mobility program. The problem there is that there is need for more funding to have another shop, to have more you know, former farm workers building those housing or even you know, using the high school, uh, like you said, um, programs. There's this program of youth, you know, build, youth build that brings uh, youth also. 
So there are opportunities. What we need is financing and ways to have the voices of these farm workers uh, letting us know uh, what is the, you know, a dignified housing for the place and then how to study it. So I think that the idea to think about developers and thinking who can be the developers and trying to figure out a program where you have the, the knowledge of which farms need these things, which farmers want to get into a program like this with uh, developers and having farm workers or former farm workers building housing for farm workers. That would be the dream. So again, we go back again to allocation of money. If we're giving money for uh, conservation land, but not thinking about the housing on those land, I think that's really important. But thank you for your suggestions. And Tom, may I just respond a little bit? I, I thank you, Marita, and thank you for your work. Um, I'm just gonna mention here that there is a cottage shop in Jamaica, it might be the Jamaica cottage shop, I'm not sure. And I mean, Jamaica, Vermont, which borders Wyndham at where I live. And um, I, I, they've been having sales on these cottages for not that much, you know, um, kind of a tiny house, but um, maybe $15,000. And you're right, it's a matter of funding, um, but with this, uh, the, COVID money coming, and I don't know how this fits into the co the infrastructure picture, but it seems to me that it's um, it's really applicable. So, but that's you know that was if I were queen for the day and ruled the world. So, but thank you and thank you for your work. Really appreciate it. All right, Representative uh, Norris, and then Hango, and I just want to say before actually before Representative Norris, you know we had thought that this would be a ninety minute hearing, but this is. I'd like to have these questions asked and talked about, and it looks like agriculture has a fairly free schedule after this as um, anyway, but we're going to continue asking questions till we, you know, till we're um, done. This has been, this has been really um, quite, quite good. So thank you. Representative Norris and then Hango. Yeah, I mean, I was uh, a farmer for 40 years and all of our Howard or hired help either lived in uh the house with us or or we had uh, other housing on other farms but um, I think you know until we can ensure that dairy farmers are getting a a profitable price for their milk and not uh, up and down and up and down you if you ask the farmers every one of them appreciates they're Latino workers. I mean, if they, they weren't here, these farmers would not be able to exist. And they know that and they treat them well. But uh, if they had any extra money to, you know, to build another house, I'm sure they would. But, uh, it, you know, a lot of times that money goes to the grain bill or the mortgage just to continue to survive. So I think you have to take that into account. I mean, farming is low margin at best. I mean, when we were farming, there was never any money left over at the end of the month. It all went barely enough to cover everything. So I don't think things have changed a whole lot, but uh, I wish they would. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Representative Hango, then Triana. Thank you very much. I have some very specific questions that should be um, one sentence answers from some of the witnesses because I didn't quite get the facts and figures. Um, so the first one is for um, Tom and the, the figure was 70% of Vermont farms belong to the Milk with Dignity standards. Is that correct? No, sorry. Um, there, there have been the number of farms in the program at any given time changes a little bit because it's based on the size of Ben and Jerry's supply chain. But there have been around 70 dairy farms in the program. Uh, we estimate that the milk produced by those farms is about 20% of Vermont's milk. 
20 percent i'm i apologize i'm sure i heard the no wrong problem. number <laughs> and the other question is also for you um and that is in terms of violations of the rental housing codes when when you do inspections did you say there were it was about a 46 percent compliance rate yes that's about right yes. okay great thank you very much and the next question is for um liz gleason please um, did you say that there are approximately 8,000 workers who are not family members on farms in Vermont? Yes, that's what was in John's report, about 8,500 non-family workers, not all of whom are living on farms. Great, thank you very much. And the last questions are for um, Dan Baker, please. Um, seasonal H-2A visa holders, um, does, is there, uh, there is a requirement that housing needs to be provided. Is there a requirement for inspections of those, of that housing? So uh, my, my research is primarily on dairy farms, but I believe, uh, I know that, let me say that I know that there are standards. Yeah. Okay. Great. If, Thank I, may, you. if I may add in, there are requirements for inspections. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, and that's what I thought being that it was a, a government program. Um, and the last question is also for Professor Baker, please. Um, undocumented migrant farm workers, you had a slide and you took it down before I could get any, um, get the rest of the information. You mm -hmm. did say you were going to supply that, that slide deck to us. I have, yeah. Okay, great. Um, thank you. Can you just tell me what the approximate number of undocumented migrant farm workers there are in Vermont? I can give you the range because that, there is no census. Right. So, uh, probably at the low end, it's around 800, and mm -hmm. that would include uh, workers and, and their kind of family members. And at the very high end, it would be 1,500. I think the most folks would now would be uh, closer to 1,300. So okay. somewhere between 800 and 1,300. Um, Representative Hango, if you don't, if I could just make a comment. Um, in our research with farmers, and this goes to uh, what the previous representative, uh, Representative Norris was saying, uh, in our research with farmers consistently, farmers express very, very high levels of appreciation uh, for their uh, Latinx workers. I just want to Make that as and for their U.S. workers as well, but I just wanted to make that point that uh, that's been very consistent in our research. Yes, I understand that. I have several farms in my district um, that have a great difficulty finding folks to work for them. So it is an important piece of our economy. I understand that for sure. And I appreciate everybody being here today. This has been extremely informative and I'm really happy to work with the agricultural community in, a, in the housing sense, in the housing realm. Thank you. Representative Triano, then O'Brien. Thank you, Chair Stevens, and I wanted to thank everyone for their presentations here today. The, um, it, it's obvious to me, and I'm sure most everyone else on these committees, that it's a subject that's been overlooked, not intentionally, but it just happened that way, that um, in our discussions and funding around housing, um, and it's unfortunate that this happens because we all know, at least I know, and I'm sure, again, most others know that, um, as uh, Representative Norris said, farmers can't exist without help at this point. Um, so, you know, it's really um, um, something that we need to think a lot more about and, and put some creative thinking in it. And when uh, Marita was speaking about um, uh, farm workers building cabins or uh, building uh, uh, homes on, on farms uh, where farmers are not able to afford um, to provide better housing. It occurred to me, you know, back in the uh, mid seventies, I worked at Community Action up in the Northeast Kingdom here. And we had a program that was um, stumped the house basically that um, we, had, um, we had crews working in the woods cutting timber. Um, and we had a sawmill that uh, milled these uh, these uh, logs out, and uh, we had a crew that were building low-income uh, low uh, housing for, as a result of that. So it came to mind that 
Uh, you know, um, every farm has timber on it. Um, I don't believe there's any that don't. And that maybe we should be thinking in terms of um, a portable sawmill um, and an operator that can uh, be transported from farm to farm um, and provide lumber to uh, build housing uh, with um, uh, uh, laborers that are willing to uh, take this on and to build better homes for themselves. And I just think, you know, it's, it would not be a terrible expense. And, you know, purchasing a couple of portable sawmills would not be a terrible expense. Um, and um, there's uh, lots of folks around that uh, are capable of operating them. Just move them from farm to farm and, and uh, get some of these things going uh, where um, both the farmers and the, uh, are, are unable to uh, uh, be able to afford better housing for their, uh, for their help. Um, so that just came to mind. I did have a question on um, H2As, uh, but um, um, Chair Partridge kind of uh, answered that, uh, that dairies are, for some reason do not qualify uh, for, the, uh, for this program. But I did have a question for John. Did, is there a, a massive waiting list to get onto that program and get workers into this uh, country as, uh, on that program? Uh, to, to my knowledge, there, the program has been relatively uh, consistent in the number of farms and the number of H-2A workers in Vermont. Um, but as to whether or not there are those who are unable to, I can't answer that. Okay. I, can, I can tell you that many workers oppose to the H-2A expansion. It's being put on the House for the Farm Worker Modernization Act because even that there are um, supposedly in, you know, like uh, regulations for housing, those rarely happen. Uh, people that come into with an H-2A visa, they are linked to their workplace. If there is bad conditions, they don't have a mechanism to complain because they will be taken out of that worker visa and just sent back home. So there is a lot of problems with the H-2A program as well. So um, I want you to acknowledge that many, many farm worker organizations are opposing to the expansion to H2A. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming in and enlightening us. Thank you. Representative O'Brien and then Graham. Thank you, Chair Stevens. And thanks for everybody for coming in today. Um, I'm not really sure who wants to answer this, but one thing I'd love to hear a little bit about is just what are the, the stories of these workers? Where, how do they end up in Vermont, both both some of the documented ones and, and the undocumented? And then what's what's um, leading to the, the high turnover rate? Is it partly housing and wages or do they return to their homes? Um, do they move on to other jobs? Uh, any, any of those questions? Like Tom, you mentioned even the there, there were some indigenous dialects and I had no idea where, <laughs> who speaks that dialect and where they were from. So, so any answers to those questions would be great. Yeah, I can answer about that because, you know, my justice is the organization in the state that it's um, coming with all these people together leading. Most of the farm workers are from South Mexico and Guatemala. They ended up in Vermont because they hear from other family members or uh, people from their towns that there is this job that is all year round. So it's not seasonal. You don't have to be going around the harvest, following the harvest, housing is provided. So you don't have to pay rent. And the main reason why people migrate to the USA is because of all so many um, treats that like, as NAFTA had happened years ago where people that were farming in their countries or were living, they got out of options. Now there are pipelines passing through their crops. So they are losing uh, um, everything. The economy is really bad in Mexico and Latin America. So it's like more of a forced migration. Um, also the conditions, uh, like I said, you know, people end up in Vermont geographically not knowing where are they gonna stay. And by living at the farm, you know, they live where they work and they work where they live. They don't have access to go to different places or to know other parts of the state. That's why we, you know, migrant justice exists. So people can get together 
uh, get the driver's licenses to move around, have access to, um, to, yeah, to the driver's license and also this policy, like putting a wall between the police and immigration enforcement. We're a border state, so we have border patrol uh, all around. Um, and I hear a lot of people saying, you know, farm workers are appreciated by the farmers. I have to say, yes, they are appreciated as a labor force, uh, as um, their workers, but not as people. So not every farmer, I'm not, I just don't wanna say every farmer is bad, but many, many times uh, we encounter situations uh, where this worker end up in a farm where they didn't know exactly how much they were gonna earn uh, how many hours they were going to work. We have the data about, you know, people work about 60, 80 hours per week, sometimes without a day off, without breaks. Um, like we said, sharing housing, you know, sometimes people sharing one bed, one, one person is going to work, the other person is coming to sleep. People are sleeping in couches where people are cooking. Um, we have a lot of information, again, in our web page, and I could pull out slideshows, but... Um, I, I ask you to trust what we've been saying for the past 10 years. Um, yeah, I think that kind of answered a lot of your questions there are indigenous language. We have found people from Guatemala that weren't able to communicate. We were able to find translators. Um, yeah, so just going back to, to appreciation for farm workers, I think we need to figure it out and really understand what is appreciation, what that word means when, when we talk about that. And if we really appreciate our workers, we have to understand if they have good housing, if they had good schedules, they're gonna come to work happy. Like any of us, if we have a dignified work, we're gonna be working happy and the products are gonna be better. Representative O'Brien, if I could just, just jump in. I, I just wanna say uh, really what Marita said, I just wanna confirm. Uh, and our research with interviewing farm workers in Vermont, it's totally unusual uh, that Vermont up here on the Canadian border, you know, northern, northern United States, the workers that are here on our farms come from the southern Mexico. Uh, the majority are from Chiapas as the department. We found about 89% from Mexico and about 11% from Guatemala. So just confirming what Marita said. Um, I also have been working on projects in Honduras for almost 20, for more than 20 years now. And uh, the situations down there are, is really dire and, and getting more difficult. Uh, most of our workers here are from Mexico and Guatemala, but that it is surprising that we do not have more from Central America. And that may, I could see that uh, changing. And this the last thing I'll add is that, you know, ours worked uh, is a complex question. When we asked workers how many hours they want to work, um, you know, we found about 70 hours a week. And there's certainly some workers that are, that are overworked and some workers that want more workers. But uh, in our most recent surveys, workers on the, the average worker, the median worker is working about the number of hours that we were told they would like to work. That's not to say that some are not being overworked or some being underworked, but, um, 70 hours is what we find is what they'd like. And if they don't get 50 hours, they'll leave the farm. And that's because of the amount of money they can make in 70 hours, because if they will make more, of course, they will work less hours. Like most of us. <laughs> uh, could I ask one more question? Sure, Tom. Uh, just, it, is there a feeling of, of the migrant workers wanting to put down roots in Vermont? Because I would assume the affordable housing question changes if, I mean, immigrant populations are so important to, to the United States and, and Vermont, and it would be fabulous if a lot of these workers stayed here and, and we saw, you know, subsequent generations. Well, demographics are changing. In our survey, like our first survey, we have like a 6% of female in farms, not everyone working, more mostly as partners or sisters. That number has doubled. It's not big enough still, but there are families growing here and more people are staying here. And when we ask uh, our members, you know, what's the reason? Most of the reason is because Vermont has more access for immigrants, uh, like the driver's license, the, like the fair impartial policy, all the things that as an organization we've been achieving on the past years has been like, uh, 
and add for these uh, migrant workers to stay. There are other crews of farm work, or not farm workers, but immigrant workers, like from Honduras, for example, they, El Salvador, they work in construction. Um, they come and go. There is, a, there is an immigrant population in Vermont. Now that we've been distributing the, uh, the Vermont uh, COVID fund that was released, we've seen a lot of immigrant families and people uh, that uh, you know are undocumented. We're still invisible. I have to say there is no a neighborhood, a town, uh, a store that brings people together. And that's why it's so important that our organization exists for, for gathering these people together. Great, thank you. Um, Representative Graham, then Bach. Yes, uh, I don't have a question, but I just want to kind of make a general statement. Um, being a former dairy farmer, uh, now transitioning into crops and beef, but um, one of the issues on, on dairy farms, the biggest issue is there's no profit. There's no profit margin. And on most any farm, the last place money goes is in the buildings because there is none left when you get done um, paying for your grain or your, your power. And <clears throat> you probably could find several farm owners that are living in inadequate housing because there is no money. You could, uh, it's easy to say, you could build a cabin and plunk it on a farm, farmer's land. But then there's other factors you gotta consider. That building's gotta have to have water. The building's gotta have sewer. The building's gotta have electricity. And you're gonna have to pay property tax on that building. And it probably has taken some land away that you were using for your animals, to feed your animals. So this is a deeper problem than just not having a house or not having affordable housing. It goes much deeper than that. And uh, farms that have undocumented workers, what's gonna happen when people start seeing houses popping up or cabins popping up or buildings being remodeled? It's gonna raise a red flag and somebody's gonna go find out why and those farmers are going to be taken, those workers are going to be taken off those farms. So I hope as this moves forward, is there's, I fully, fully support the issue. But I hope that people will take into account the whole picture and not just part of it, because it is a big issue overall. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Representative Bach, I'm going to ask you to hold for a second. Um, Buster had a, had his hand up before, and then and then I lost him. Um, Buster, are you still here? Uh, yes, I am here. Are you able to hear me okay? Yep. Okay. Um, um, one question that I've been advocating for um, is, I don't know if you know or not, but from what I know, okay, we have lots of organizations that have been talking about this issue. Some actually, a lot of it with the uh, milk with dignity. And I would suggest because we're almost, you're out of your session and everyone wants to learn more, at the very least, on the agriculture side through the farm to play in uh, different parts, it would be very simple and very easy to form a working group and or committee. And there is no housing organization to work with farmers in particular and work with um, Efficiency Vermont to work with the USDA, which is underutilized. And many of you folks, geez, there's funding at the USDA level specifically for farm housing. 
that's underutilized? Well, in every state that I've been communicating, um, and I'm going to say there's about a dozen states that I've communicated with on this subject on how do you build homes for farmers? How are you able to build homes for farm workers? And everything that I hear, whether it's Oregon, California, Wisconsin, Maine, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, they have the same thing. It starts with housing organizations, builders, farmers, farmers, utilizing the resources. And it starts with a working committee. And we have a committee here in Vermont, which could be formed tomorrow. And it may take three working committees. And the other thing is, there's many success stories across the country that have utilized those funding and addressed the issues talked about here on H2A workers, undocumented workers, and so much data. We don't need data. We need a housing organization to work with our farmers, work with planners, and work with organizations that can do the work. For example, one that's not here today, Yost Bill. They've been eager. They're factored in with the Department of Labor. They're construction workers, and they're learning. So there's a combination of action that could take place immediately and similar action that has taken place in many other states. So Vermont needs to build a committee, have a housing organization, one or two of them be a part of it, utilize the funds that are out there, work together and advocate for new funding, utilizing the public sector, utilizing the private sector. There's so much private sector that we could eliminate all the federal money and just work with the private sector and uh, community funds to address what other states have. Vermont needs to do this and we need to form a committee. We need to find that Vermont housing organization that typically does the work of what has been talked about, working together with farmers to build homes, improve the present homes, and work with nonprofits, builders and planners, farm workers and farmers, and build homes much needed in rural communities in Vermont. That has been done in several states, and it takes housing organizations Generally, because they are the experts, they have in place every day tools to put things together, but they can't put things together without what we are talking about, without there being a committee, without funding resources being put in, into place. So that's, that's what really needs to be done ASAP is start a committee and get a housing organizations, builders, youth build, and everyone work together. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Representative Bach, then Bloomley, and then we'll close off the morning with after Representative Bloomley. Um, thanks, Tom. Um, uh, this might be for uh, Buster. This is kind of related to what he was talking about, but I was wondering, uh, they must have the same problems we have in the dairy industry in Canada. Are they dealing with it any differently than we are? And if so, what is it? Honestly, when it comes to farm housing in Canada, I have not done much research, but I do know when it comes to dairy, um, it's a multiple problem. I believe um, Canada has similar problems. Uh, something that's often talked about is oversupply. Well, we could talk about the dairy industry every day, all day. And what really needs to happen, in my opinion, 
just talking dairy because I want to be specific to agriculture as a whole. The farmers need to set the price and eliminate the processors. The processors need to ask the farmers, hey, how much do you want for your milk? And then those people pay it. The way it is now, everything is taken advantage of. But here in Vermont, processors, farmers, on all sectors of agriculture, in different states, whether you're talking New Mexico, Oregon, New Jersey, Maine, they have all addressed the issues of agriculture, address the issue in the needs of the labor. Agriculture needs labor. Agriculture is essential. Housing is essential. So we need to work together because other states have built homes off the farm. They've built homes on the farm working together and utilizing that. I don't think there's ever been homes built in agriculture communities here in Vermont as they have other states. And by having a committee and working uh, together, we could have success stories. We can say, hey, Vermont, our farmers made improvements. We're working toward positive success stories. Hey, we built homes on farms. We built homes off the farms. We address the needs of affordability. Addressing it is, is the need in action now is the greater need because we've been talking about this my since November of 2019 with many organizations like, hey, we have boots to the ground, we want to work, but connecting the dots, that's the challenging part. And putting dollars to work for our farmers. Our farmers walking into the USDA and say, hey, we want to build a home. Well, here's about a 50 pages for you, Mr. Farmer, on top of all the other work. That's where housing organizations can assist farmers on that process because it's very daunting. It's very hard for our farmers and want to address these things. That's why our farmers are here. Our farmers are talking about this and we need, need to hear from them too. And forming a committee is the best way to get voices heard and put dollars and blueprints in place. Okay, thank you. Um, Representative, <clears throat> excuse me, Representative Blooming, last question or comment. Uh, it, <clears throat> well, the comment is that um, I've just found this really, really interesting and um, helpful. And I'm very grateful to both chairs for bringing our committees together and to um, all of you who have visited with us today. I, I had one kind of, um, kind of uh, technical or practical question and then um, a more open-ended one. And, and the first is when code violations are reported or discovered, what happens? Who, who acts? Are repairs made? And I, I, I don't know if Tom, this is the best question for you. I think Tom can answer as farms under the milk dignity program. I can answer under farms not under Great. the milk program. And I think what happens is nothing. Uh, when there are reports, maybe the farmer is going to receive a letter saying you have a certain amount of time to do something. Uh, we know that, uh, unfortunately, the capacity of uh, having investigations uh, at the farm level don't happen. If you ask any farm worker, if somebody came to inspect the house, that never happened. Um, so that's why we, we had to create this program in a response of, of the lack of, of this happening in housing. And yeah, I, I Tom, just take it on, on my identity, but if you also want to answer to Representative Graham or all projects that we're working on. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, I could say um, in a way that the Milk with Dignity program, we as the Standards Council are, part of our job is exactly what, what you were just asking about, Representative Bloomley, that, that when there's a, a, housing, a housing unit that's not yet up to code, 
our job is to work with the farm on a solution that addresses whatever the, the issue may be. Um, housing is, is a tricky area for, uh, for all the reasons that folks have discussed, including what Representative Norris and Representative Graham raised that, uh, you know, just one of the many is that you can get by providing housing that doesn't meet code standards for a while, but you can't get by if you stop paying the grain bill or the power bill or your lender. And so there's there's a lot of structural pressure that leads to farm worker housing being one of the things that's at the bottom of the priority list. Uh, but that that is one of the things that the Milk with Dignity program is designed to, as best we can to try to help address that factor and the other ones uh, that, that folks have raised, including as Representative Norris pointed out, milk prices have been not only low, but very unpredictable that even if they go up for a month, they're likely to go right back down soon and you don't know exactly when or by how much. Uh, but the program is designed as much as we can to try to look at those factors as well as uh, the really important one Marita just mentioned, of just that, that um, of kind of farm worker fear that, that the reality is you know, many farm workers are um, you know, even where in many regards on a day-to-day -day basis, many people say, I have, a, I have a decent relationship with my employer. It feels very tenuous that, that it could all fall apart on a moment's notice that if, I, if I'm perceived as, as having asked for too much or pushy or having complained, I'm gone and, and, I, and there's no, uh, a real, it's a real high wire act feeling for many farm workers in that regard. And so the program is also designed to help uh, make it possible for people to come forward and to look for solutions together uh, where people uh, aren't risking their jobs and or, or at least don't feel don't feel like it even if even if the farmer might say no I, I want to hear from you workers experience may not they may not feel the same way and may not come uh, come forward about those things I also wanted to just really briefly add one thing that just to the extent that that um that the committees are are as representative Parker's noted it's a federal legal issue but uh, to the extent that folks are discussing the relevance of the H-2A visa program to the dairy industry. Um, I think just a couple things that, that that's important to be aware of. Um, one is that, that even if the federal government were to change the H-2A program so that year-round farm workers could be, uh, such as dairy, could be covered through the program, um, that's not a way for people who are currently milking cows in Vermont as undocumented immigrants to regularize their status. They would be ineligible to apply for H-2A visas. So the program would be other people who are not here now um, would be potentially eligible to apply for H-2A visas, but everyone who's here now would not be included in that, in that program. I think sometimes folks, you know, in some ways, my, my guess is that um, that HOA may have an appeal because it feels like the, the current status quo is very difficult. There's a lot of challenges and drawbacks and there's an apple farm down the road that's using H2A, let's give that a try. But H2A is not designed to look at those issues uh, or, or to take into account some of the issues that are, um, that are affecting farms and workers such as low and volatile milk prices, structural pressures to, to where you have to put other other issues, uh, other other priorities ahead of farm worker housing, or um, the the fear experienced by many farm workers um, about uh, that that makes it pretty scary to come forward about a, a concern. Um, H two A program is not designed towards those things, and but the milk with dignity program is, and, and I think that um, that the progress happening so far that farms in the program are making is is evidence that that those uh, those factors are being addressed as best we can. And I just want to jump in on what Tom said. I think it is um, for dairy, you know, dairy is not seasonal and H2A is set up to be a, a something to a visa program for seasonal farm workers. So the possibility of developing an, uh, a temporary visa program for year round workers um, is one of the things that uh, may be considered by the federal government. But I want to go back to your, your first comment um, on enforcement. You know, one of the things that Milk with Dignity provides is it provides some funds for improving houses. So it's not just uh, here's the violation, but it's, you know, here's the issue and there's some funds. And I think that is one of the issues that we're hoping, many of us are hoping that the committee is going to continue, is going to consider is uh, how do we help farmers given their, given their protracted struggle right now with those volatile but generally low milk prices, 
if we want to improve housing, where's that money going to come from? And so if the committee could consider um, creating a fund that farmers could access, I think that'd be very helpful. And on that, I think, sorry, uh, sorry, one more thing. And on that, I oh. think Tom can share also, you know, a little bit about the work that's been doing around collaborating with developers, collaborating with uh, not only putting a cabin, just responding to Representative Graham, it's not just putting a cabin without thinking about the sewer system and the electricity and all that. It's really working uh, to making housing affordable, efficient, but the idea of the cost not going to the farmer, you know, we can create a plan that already uh, Efficiency Vermont is working on where the developer is owning the house and they are the one, the, the landlords. So farmers don't have that burden on them. But I don't know, Tom, if you wanna add more detail on that. No, I think that's about it. Yeah, I think I think what Representative Graham raised was really important. And that's part of what I meant uh, when I said in my own testimony that uh, one of our crucial uh, goals is to engage in context specific problem solving. And that means that, that there are some farms where the current septic and power hookups can be can be used with with new housing and um, and that piece of it is relatively straightforward. But there's other situations where that's a, a real complicated headache, and uh, and we have to take that into account in working with farms and farm workers on what type of solution is going to work for this farm. And and that's part of why bringing in partners like Efficiency Vermont has been helpful for us um, to see, you know, to have additional partners ready to to engage in all of the the details that it's going to take to to tackle each. Uh, the challenge as best uh, as, as best we can. All right, thank you everybody. This is a lot. This is um, an introduction to another simple solution um, moving forward, I'm sure. It's all, I know it's the introduction to the complexities of what we're facing are exactly what I anticipated. And I think that the Agricultural Committee has lives in you know, on that side of this this equation, and um, I really appreciate the time put forward. Carolyn, do you have final comments from your point of view? Yeah, Tom, I think I ended up with more questions than I did answers. Um, but um, I'm just going to make a recommendation. I I'm finishing up a book called The Plain of Snakes by Paul Theroux, which is all about Mexico and he his travel through Mexico. And uh, he ends up in Chiapas and uh, it's been really fascinating. It's opened my eyes to the situation that many in particular Mexicans and Guatemalans are dealing with. And uh, it, it, I, I think I already knew why folks were moving North um, to come to the States, but this book just lays it right out. I highly recommend it, The Plain of Snakes by Paul Theroux. Um, and I want to thank you, Tom, for including us in this conversation. I think it's been really, really fantastic. And I'm kind of excited about taking up this more. I would look, uh, you know, would look forward to maybe having an additional meeting or two with you, with our committees. I think it would be um, really, really helpful. And I want to thank everyone for all of your work on this, the, the data and your um, hard work of bringing this all to our attention. Thanks so much. And just wait till we have a joint hearing on compensation um, and minimum <laughs> wage. Um, yeah. That'll be, that's another big chunk of, of the same story. Yeah. So thank you everybody. This, our committee, um, we have witnesses who are waiting to testify on another bill. We're gonna take a break until 1130 and we'll be back. So the witnesses can, can hang out till then, that would be great. And again, for the witnesses who came today, um, Marita, Tom, uh, Dan, uh, Gus, Liz, and Buster, thank you so much um, for your time and for bringing this to us. And um, we're gonna keep working on it. Thank you, this is really illuminating. So thank you so much. And thanks to the committee, the Agricultural Committee for joining us today, real treat. So General Tommy, do you have a comment before we go? Uh, no question. Uh, so, General Committee, we just stay here. Uh, yeah, we're going to take.